more, we're going to look at some of the most <laughs> remarkable historical documents in all of American history. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, please, David. Just, just one, one question about about the title page. It says it's by Mrs. Esther Levy, and then in little letters underneath it, it says not Esther Jacobs. What's no, that about? No, no, no. It says nay, nay. In other words, oh, that's nay? her maiden. Mm, yeah, that's yes. her ma that's her maiden name. So oh, she okay. her full I... name her full name is Esther Jacobs Levy. It. Uh, she's uh she she's sort of like uh you know. Uh, she she wants her family to get some of the credit. But if you look her up, we don't know a hell of a lot about her. We don't know where she lived. There, huh. uh, very little do we know about her. The book was published in Philadelphia, but this book was read all over the place. And in New York, it was very popular. So there's no, there's, if, if he didn't know about this cookbook, you know, it would be like, uh, I don't know, it would be like not knowing about... Uh, 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 shades of gray or something like that. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, 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 it was, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, was, it was very popular. Everybody would know at least what it was uh, about it in the Jewish community. Okay. So, Thanks. all right, uh, Rabbi, or, or whoever is going to take us into our little break or whatever we do, uh, 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 we have now completely completed our, our task for the morning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. This was wonderful. Um, Oh my goodness. This was great. Thank you. And I can't wait. And I know that next week we are going to end up diving even more into everything. We, we are currently on a pace of about, I don't know, five <laughs> or six verses of Song of Songs per week. So, you exaggerate. <laughs> I exaggerate. <laughs> it depends on the week. We've had some very, but in any case, this is fantastic. So thank you. Um, to give everybody a little direction. It is 1116 on my clock. So I yeah. think what we are going to do is we are going to say that we will reconvene at 1125, if that's okay with everybody. So I know some of you are just joining and we're really glad you are here. Thank you for being very on time. <laughs> the rest of us are not quite as on time and that's okay. Those who would like to are welcome to stay sitting in front of your computers and chat for a few minutes, correct, Andrew? Yeah, okay, so you're welcome to stay in front of your computer and chat. Know that the whole thing is still streaming, however. Um, and at 11.25, we will come back together. Among other things in those, sorry, now eight minutes, make sure you grab a Kiddush cup because we will start when we reconvene with Kiddush for Shabbat morning. Mm -hmm. And then we will dive into Dr. Zola's favorite documents from the American Jewish archives, which I admitted last week is the part that I am the most excited about. <laughs> Although I really have loved every minute of it, I definitely am really excited about some of the greatest hits. She's something else. She's yeah. All right. So I, know I when you are all of it, but I, be aware of when heard, you wow. Be aware of when you yourself are muted and unmuted. You are welcome <laughs> to sit and chat for a few minutes, and we will continue as the screen now says. Way to go, Andrew! At eleven twenty-five. Although then people can't chat. But either way, yeah, I'll be right I'm gonna there. turn off my camera for. We'll we'll come back at eleven twenty-five and continue. Gary, are you still there? No. Let me give him a break. Too. Hi, Sherry. <coughs> Hi, how are you? Wow. Yeah, it's a, he is a delightful human being. I, I'm trying to remember when I was very active um, and attended conferences. I I don't have I, I have reference, but I've got it filed someplace now. I can't I can't find. But uh, I'm thinking about a uh, probably biennial conference um, where. 
Um, Dudley was a speaker and I did make some comment that was recorded. Wish I could remember the year. You know, I don't know. I don't remember that at all. I was, unfortunately, I never got to hear Dudley in person. Um, uh, oh my, oh my. Yeah. I, I remember so, so much, so, such a detailed recollection of Dudley. Uh, it's, I was a, a California educator and, you know, the, with limited funds. So <laughs> very. I, I traveled very little in the early days. Well, I have to recall that this the time I'm trying to think about was in the time of marches in Milwaukee on desegregation and on redlining and housing. Yeah, David's family was fighting that in California. Mm -hmm. So it had to be the 60s. 60s or 70s? 60s. 60s. No, 60s, 60s and very, very early 70s. Yeah. Let me see, I had all my babies in the 50s. <laughs> and 50s, yeah, uh, end, end of 60s. Um, uh, uh, yes, after that, that, and that, um, after 1969, I think I think it was about seventy one or seventy two. Okay, and good. I'm, I remember because I did the presidency of the sisterhood, uh, maybe two years after I had had a um, lost a baby. Uh, you know, that's that's at least a, a good way of remembering a year. Or a not hmm. so good way of remembering the year sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so funny. Yeah, no, in 1976, I remember that year. I'm referring to a chat that just came on from Linda. Yeah, I am. Um... Oh, in fact, I have. Where did I put it? To get back to Rosenzweig for a minute, and that's primarily a Germanic sounding name as opposed to being Polish. Uh, with the fluidity of borders going on in the 19th century, did he have some Germanic heritage also um, in his background? No clue. Whoa. Whoa. Um, this writing that Dudley did is dated 1965 um, ah. for the uh, JCS pamphlet. That's interesting. <laughs> And of course, you know, the pamphlet is on the efficacy of prayer. Are you familiar with this? Uh, Sharon, yes. David? Yeah. Yeah. There's, you know, there are some things that he will always be remembered for. And I think that is one of them. Because that's a question that people struggle with even today. Gloria, you should, I think one of the things you should think about doing would be to sit down and make a timeline of your life. You know, try and fill in about when things happened and so that we have that timeline of your life. Um, that was easily done by uh, Friedman, um, the secretary, the executive director and Emmanuel, she was the historian. And I'm sure all of that is at the temple. Okay, good. Glad to know that. 
but I, I should go and check on that and see. Right, plus you have so many other things that have happened since. Yeah. Look, you know. As soon as, soon as I can get out again. Uh, listen. <laughs> We're sitting here looking at the, the river, which is completely covered with snow and now has some tracks on it because somebody went ski polling or, you know, cross country, cross -country skiing. skiing on the river. And it's just beautiful, but it's how often can we be shut in? It's, it's tough. Well, tracks from the deer are still there. The deer's tracks are still there, yeah. <laughs> we have a rabbit right outside some of our windows. Oh, yeah. those are fun. We used to have one of those, but he got- well, it's fun, except that our dog is not a fan. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh okay. Yeah, cats are so much more mild like that. They just go. <laughs> you know? Actually, I would say, Rabbi Borowski, your dog is exceptionally a fan. <laughs> okay, that could also be. Bartlett would love to play tag with the rabbit. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he has tried going through the windows to that effect. Not succeeded yes. yet, thank God. <laughs> I bet his kids would too. We yeah. have deer. Oh, how nice. I haven't, I, I haven't seen them this week, but I did last week. I wanted to let everybody know also that we, um, for our Purim spiel, we have a lot of people on these screens that are participating. So, <laughs> you know, Andrew Appel, uh, Sherry Blumberg, David Blumberg. And Rabbi Borowski and Susan Kozda and myself. So, right. so I hope you'll, you'll join it. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot We're of looking fun. forward to it. <laughs> and you should join in despite me. And do you have a costume ready? <laughs> oh, my. I'm just saying. <laughs> Costumes are still encouraged. Or at least a silly hat. Thursday night, Friday. Wednesday night, Friday night. Afternoon. Friday night, no, or post forum. Tomorrow, Friday. tomorrow you are even encouraged for Silly Sunday. That is true. Okay, it looks like I think everybody is almost everybody at least is back. So, Cantor Barash, if you would be so kind as to lead us in a kiddish. If everybody has some type of fruit of the vine. We can sure. join together in Kiddush. Okay. Okay, so I think the way we do this, we're going to mute everybody for a moment, and then we'll can we take all can, can we take a breath and then go right to Cantor? I, I think we might need to take out in just one breath. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ve shamru vene Israel et hashabad la soder hashabad le dorotam berit olam ve shamru vene Israel et hashabad la soder hashabad le dorotam berit olam ben yu vene Israel oti le olam oti le olam Veshamru vene Israel et hashabat la soder hashabat le dorotam berit olam ki sheshet yamim ki sheshet yamim asa donai et hashamayim ve et haaret veshamru vene Israel et hashabat la soder hashabat le dorotam berit olam Uvayom Ashmi Shavad Vainafash Shavad Vainafash Shavad Vainafash Ve Shamru Vene Israel et Tashabad La Soder Hashabad Le Dorotam Berit Olam Alkein Beirach Adonai Es Yom Hashabad Vayakadashehu Sabri. 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 S
Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Uh, Susan, Shabbat we are shalom. turning to you for a moment. Yes, my turn. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. In this week's Torah portion, Truma, we read the beautiful verse, Vasuli Mikdash Vishachanti Betocham. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. This verse, much later, we have echoing. Mm -hmm. try, try muting everybody else. We're good. We should be good. Go ahead. Okay. This verse, much later, put to music by the Shakers, and very recently reclaimed in Reformed synagogues, O oh Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy. I'm not listening to this. I just had to do something. I'm coming in. I'm trying to get these open. I got you. Okay. Oh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. And in Thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Dr. Rabbi Zola is a living sanctuary of the holy mystery of love in so many ways. One, he is, a living, he is living his passion and his purpose as the executive director of the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives, about which we are going to learn in just a moment. I was blessed to have known Dr. Marcus, to heard him as a scholar in residence, and to have grown up as the daughter of one of his students. And I know how proud he would have been of you last night with the way you tied in our congregation's history with the portraits of courage you shared and today with everything that you shared with us. Two, as Edward M. Ackerman, Family Distinguished Professor of the American Jewish Experience and Reformed Jewish History at HUCJIR in Cincinnati, as he has inspired and continues to inspire rabbinical students to serve the reform movement and to make a difference in the world. Current and past students of Dr. Zola's connected to CEEBJ, share how engaging and inspiring Dr. Zola is. Three, and probably most important, Dr. Zola is a living sanctuary of the holy mystery of love, for he is a mensch and caring. And once you are in his world, he will forever be there for you, especially if you are a redhead. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Zola. Susan, thank you so much for such a beautiful, beautiful words. I, <clears throat> I, I you, you know, my my face always gets as red as my hair when uh, such uh, beautiful things are said, and it means so much to me. Susan didn't mention, but it should be mentioned that. Uh, my first 16 years in the rabbinate, uh, I, I was working, of course, at the college, <clears throat> but I was the dean of admissions for the college. And that was my, it was my job to try to rustle up as many students for our various programs as I could. And then uh, I oversaw the admissions process for the rabbinical school. And uh, uh, Susan uh, used to come to our programs that uh, uh, that's how I met her uh, first, I believe. And uh, uh, there's so many rabbis, cantors, educators, and, um, and other people who, uh, who uh, I met during those 16 years uh, doing recruitment uh, who have really enriched my whole world. And you can only imagine how nice it is to see people who you met in high school or in college, and now are many of them, many of them are, are very prominent. I mean, well, look at your own uh, rabbi, Rabbi Goralski, who, uh, you know, uh, she was my student, but I didn't know her in high school, I don't think, did I? No, so uh, you can imagine how 
uh, gratifying it is. So thank you, Susan, very much. As for the red hair, she's absolutely right. Uh, I had one of the most disconcerting experiences uh, last week. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of craziness going on during this pandemic. One of them was I get this email from out of the blue from some girl who never spoke to me. Girl, by the way, girl who's probably closer to 70 than anything else now. And, <laughs> and she, uh, she was in grammar school with me and uh, she invites me, we're gonna have a grammar school reunion. Oh my. And, uh, and so uh, I, I wasn't going to attend because I don't know anybody from my grand, uh, you know, grammar school. I mean, I, I knew this name, but I, I, none of them are you know, in my life or anything of that sort. So I told my wife, my beautiful bride of 45 years, I told her about the invitation and, and, uh, and I, I said, I'm not going. I mean, it'll be too shocking to the system. You know, I said to suddenly I'm gonna be seeing people who in my mind, if I can remember them at all or see pictures of them were children and now they're, you know, you know, God help, help me. You know, they're 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 senior citizens. I I don't want to I don't want to look at them. It'll be too shocking. So my wife says to me, you, "You're a big fat snob," and she says you should go and and oh okay. So I I ended up going, and there were about 20, 25 people on on the call, and and everybody of course got to tell their story from sixth grade to the present. So it was a it was a two hour call. But the reason I'm going through this whole yarn is because what was the first thing they all said to me is Gary, you still have red hair, you know. And and uh, and in fact, I have been accused of dyeing my hair, and I resent that because first of all, it's not easy to get gray in your hair when you're dying it. That takes a lot of money, and I don't have that kind of money. And uh, so this is a, a lot lighter than it used to be, but it still has some color. So uh, there you have it. Now, friends, I'm gonna uh, 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 tell you uh, about something in which you should all take a lot of pride. And that is, I know that uh, congregation, uh, Emmanuel B'nai Jezrin is, uh, uh, is a, uh, um, a proud member of our reform movement. And as a member of the Union for Reform Judaism, uh, I'm sure you all know that your congregation contributes some of its dues to belong to the Union. And those, those monies help uh, for our movement to have unity and to come together and to be strong in our convictions toward uh, the reformation of Judaism. Some of the money that comes from the union by design goes to the Hebrew okay. Union College. Okay. Okay. So the Hebrew Union College uh, is uh, uh, patronized by, in part, by the union. So all of us who are at the Hebrew Union College, we're connected to you too. And the American Jewish Archives, which is located, as the rabbi said correctly, on the historic Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College, takes up quite a big, in a minute I'll show you, quite a big spot on the campus. It is the largest freestanding uh, research center dedicated solely to the study of American Jewish history. And it is, without question, a bona fide part it is a division of the Hebrew Union College. It's not a separate institution. It, 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 is, uh, it has its own autonomy and it has its own identity, but it is a part of the college. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that all of you are on my board of directors and all of you should feel proud of not only the wonderful scholars and rabbis and teachers and cantors who uh, you receive from the halls of the Hebrew Union College, like Rabbi Berkson and Rabbi Bar Baralski and Rabbi and Cantor Barash and, uh, and Susan Cosden uh, and every congregation in the reform movement that, that has those treasures. You should also, I hope, I dare say, be proud of the great library 
that the Hebrew Union College has created over a hundred and close to 150 years. It is the second greatest library in the world, Jewish library, and the American Jewish Archive, which I'm about to show you some of its treasures, uh, which exists in Cincinnati, Ohio, and digitally all over the world. And there is nothing like it anywhere else. And that means you, each and every one of you, have been participants by being members of your congregation in the creation of these remarkable resources, which are the patrimony of the Jewish people. And you should take pride in it. With that said, I am now going to take what Kierkegaard referred to as a leap of faith. And I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to hope and pray again that I, you don't all freeze up on me. So let's see if I can do this. Oh, by the way, uh, Susan, if you look in the chat and everyone looks in the chat, you'll see that I have posted the URL for the Rosenstein material from this morning. So I'll let you take it from there. All righty, I'm about to do my thing and let's see if it works. Are we doing okay? We oh, have. Yeah. All right, praise the Lord. So let us begin. This is a beautiful sketching, as you saw last night, of the historic Cincinnati campus. And uh, here is my teacher, Susan mentioned him, uh, Dr. Jacob Rader Marcus, sitting on his desk, probably in the 1970s or 80s. And this quote is the quote you'll see uh, in the vestry of the American Jewish Archives in great big letters. This is Dr. Marcus's famous saying, a people that is not conscious of its past can have little hope for its future. And in 1947, Dr. Marcus started the American Jewish Archives. He brought it over some collections that had been gathered in the Clow Library, which was uh, just on the other side of the campus. And he opened the American Jewish Archives. And that's what it looked like in 1947, just a few boxes of papers. And now I'm going to show you what it looks like today when you come to visit us in the Queen City of the West. This is the uh, an animated version, but this is exactly how the building looks. It's attached to that building on the left there, and it has a clock tower, and there you have it. And I'm going to end this uh, flyby with uh, a photo of the entrance, a real photo. You see how gargantuan the facility is. And there you have an actual picture of it uh, with the sign. That's where I normally dwell when we're not in pandemic mode. So uh, going on, the purpose of the American Jewish Archive is to document the history of Jewish life in America, every aspect of it. And I'm going to today, without ever little time we have, I'm going to uh, explore some of the most remarkable documents and I'm going to uh, expatiate and elucidate on these documents so that you understand that every document that uh, we have is a, a building block to the history of Jewish life in America. So we begin with this man, Gerhard Riegner. On the left is Riegner as a young man during the time I'm about to speak, about which I will speak. And in, on the right is how Mr. Riegner looked in the 1980s when he received an honorary degree from the Hebrew Union College and I had the opportunity to meet him myself. As a young man, Mr. Riegner was an employee of the World Jewish Congress and he lived in Geneva, Switzerland, where he worked and was a lawyer for 
uh, the World Jewish Congress. And the World Jewish Congress, which was established and founded by Rabbi Stephen Wise in 1936, uh, begins almost immediately after its creation to do what it can to fight off the bigotry that has fallen upon the Jewish people of Germany. And then when that fails, they try their best to help save Jewish people. And when that fails, after the war, they document the destruction and this documentation, all of the papers of the World Jewish Congress are at the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati. It's one of our largest holdings. In the year 1942, just after, in January, just after the Americans enter the war, a meeting of the secret service of the Germans, the secret police, they take, uh, uh, um, excuse me, a meeting of the high administration of the uh, German Nazi uh, administration uh, is taking place in this building. Does anybody know this building? Has anybody been to this building? I see no takers. This is a this is a, a plaza, a beautiful uh, uh, vill villa, if you will, in uh, in a little suburb of Berlin called Wannsee. And I have actually been here. It is. This picture doesn't really do justice to the beauty of this uh, home. If you kept walking down the sidewalk, walking towards yourself, towards your eyes, you would be looking at a beautiful lake with birds. And this home was owned by the SS. And this meeting that took place in January was a meeting which had been approved by none other than Hitler himself. And the purpose of the meeting that took place in January of 1942 was to figure out a mechanized way to actually eradicate, to destroy, to eliminate all the Jews that were under Nazi control in continental Europe. This is called the Wannsee Conference. And that conference, was attended by these people who were charged with the duty of figuring out how we were going to literally exterminate the Jewish people. They met for three or four days. This man, you know his name, that's Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann kept notes. He was the note taker for the meeting. And those notes have been preserved. And uh, when you go into that building today, which is why I went in it, it is a museum for that event. And uh, you see the original notes with translations into all the main languages. And uh, it is a frightful experience to see the callousness of humanity talking about the plans, how uh, to uh, asphyxiate and burn and how quickly this could destroy the Jewish people. It was thought that within two or three years, the entire Jewish people could be eradicated in Europe. The other prominent figure is this man, Heidrich, uh, who was actually assassinated not too long after this in Prague, uh, and for which uh, 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 the, uh, the Nazis extracted a tremendous retribution on the citizens of Prague and uh, so forth. So um, this meeting comes up with the plan, which we call the extermination of the Jewish people. And they immediately begin to build ovens and to convert concentration camps into death camps and to build death camps. And um, there's a whole story here, but one part of it is that uh, Mr. Regner, remember Mr. Regner, I introduced you to him. 
Mr. Regner is his job is to try to determine what is going on. Uh, uh, what are the Jews? What's happening to the Jews who've been whisked away from their homes and deported and put into concentration camps? What's going on? How are they faring? Who, how are they being treated? And he's doing this for the World Jewish Congress. And he has many informants who are giving him information. And he hears in the month of March, that's two months later, he hears about this meeting from an informant. And he decides he has to report this. This is unbelievable that the Jews uh, are going to be exterminated. And so he writes a telegram and he wants to send this telegram to Stephen Wise, the president of the World Jewish Congress in New York. He takes his telegram in the beginning of April to the Council General of the United States in Geneva and asks that it be sent through military diplomatic pouch to the State Department so it can be then delivered to Rabbi Wise. The Council General demurs. He reads the telegram and says, this is out unbelievable. This is, uh, how do you know this is true? And I'm going to shorten the story so that we get to other documents, but it takes two months, three months of negotiation before uh, the Council General agrees to send the telegram. And I'll explain what the negotiation involved in just a minute. The telegram arrives in August. It's sent in August and it arrives in August and it announces for the very first time ever to the American Jewish community that the extermination of the Jewish people is underway. But there's a, another complication. Mr. Regner sends the telegram to two people concomitantly. He sends it first, of course, to Rabbi Stephen Wise in New York, the president of the World Jewish Congress. He also fortuitously sends it to a man by the name of Samuel Silverman, who is a member of parliament in Great Britain, an ally of the Americans, and also the president of the, of the uh, uh, English division of the World Jewish Congress. So he is, uh, Rabbi Wise is the international president, and Mr. Silverman, a member of parliament, which is important, is the British president. Friends, the telegram I'm about to show you never arrives in the hands of Stephen Wise. It disappears. And after two weeks, the end of August is now upon us, uh, Wise learns that this telegram has been delivered to Mr. Silverman. And so Mr. Silverman sends the telegram from Great Britain by by a Western Union, because there's communication of Western Union between British and English, uh, British, uh, the, uh, British and the uh, Americans. And that's when at the end of August, Rabbi Wise first sets his eyes on the telegram. I'm now going to show you the telegram. You are looking at the actual telegram dated uh, August the 29th, 1942. And as I said, this is the very first official word that the Jews of Europe were uh, uh, going to be uh, eradicated. And now you'll understand very clearly, you see that it says to Stephen Wise, Kara Schneeberger, she's Dr. Wise's secretary. And you'll make sense out of it because the first line is from Mr. Silverman, who is sending it from England to America. Silverman begins by saying, I have received through the foreign office 
the following message from Regner in Geneva. And now the rest is an exact quote from the original that was supposed to come to Stephen Wise. I've received an alarming report that in the Fuhrer's headquarters, plan, discuss, and under consideration that all Jews in the countries occupied or controlled by Germany, numbering three and a half to four million, should, after deportation and concentration in the East, at one blow, be exterminated to resolve once and for all the Jewish question in Europe. Now I'm going to page two. And there you see Samuel Silverman's name is attached to this telegram. And we continue reading page two. Action is reported, planned for autumn. And the methods under discussion include Prusik acid. Now, the next line, friends, is the negotiated line. The Council General, we now know, agreed to send this telegram as long as this line was included. We transmit this information with all necessary reservation, as exactitude cannot be confirmed. The informant, however, is stated to have close connections with the highest German authorities and his reports are generally reliable. Stop. Inform and consult New York. Uh, and the last line Silverman adds to the original, he says, the British Foreign Office has no information bearing on or confirming this story. That is a lie and when Stephen Wise receives this telegram and looks at it, he goes immediately to the State Department of the United States, and their answer to him is, Rabbi, we don't know about this. Let us examine it, and we will get back to you. That was also a lie, uh, because by the time the telegram finally arrived in the United States, uh, Close to a million Jews had already lost their lives. Uh, probably uh, uh, one or two hundred thousand children. And uh, the the rapidity with which the Nazis engaged in the uh, installation of the showers and the asphyxiation and then uh, cremation of the bodies was with rapid speed. So what happened? Well, Stephen Wise, assuming like all of us probably would, uh, at least uh, many of us, that the government of our people, of the American government, would be telling us the truth, he waited. And then after about six weeks, they came and called him and they said, Rabbi, we're sorry to tell you that the uh, telegram is true. Uh, and Stephen Wise, in uh, the end of November, uh, organizes a major news conference in New York, uh, announcing what has happened and um, and uh, sharing the contents of the telegram and what he knows. There are two very big books written about this topic, meaning why it took so long for the American population to realize what was going on to the Jewish people in, uh, in Europe, though they knew they were being brutalized and they knew they were being con uh, 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 organized in camps and so forth, the actual information about the res the uh, the uh, uh, extermination took quite some many months. And this is explained in two very big books, uh, one by 
Deborah Lipstadt, the other by Laurel Leff. Uh, just one bit of information that I think Deborah Lipstadt points out is that uh, Stephen Wise's news conference uh, made page 10 of the New York Times. So it didn't merit uh, front page coverage or second page coverage. And the other uh, part of it that I think Laurel Leff mentions, because her book is, I think, called Buried by the Times, I think. And Laurel Leff points out that the fact that a rabbi who was, of course, an important rabbi and a prominent rabbi, but the fact that a rabbi was the one who made this announcement, even though the State Department confirmed to him that this was going on, uh, contributed to the uncertainty of uh, what was happening and for many other reasons. So the end of the story is this, and this is the most uh, remarkable. There's a great scholar by the name of Richard Brightman. He's now retired, but he taught for many, many years at American University in Washington, DC. And he has written two or three very fine books on the Holocaust and, and so forth. And in the 1990s, uh, Dr. Brightman was at the National Archives where he was doing research on America and the Holocaust for his book. And uh, in the preface to his book, uh, which came out at, at the end of the 1990s, uh, he tells the story uh, of how he would go week after week to the archives and ask for files and so forth. And suddenly in the year 1993, 50 years after 1942, he is stunned and shocked, though he knows about the Silverman telegram that went to Stephen Wise, he is shocked to discover that he's provided with the original telegram that was sent to Stephen Wise. And now, 25 years after that event, we know even more. And uh, what we know is that uh, these were decisions made by State Department bureaucrats not by President Roosevelt and not by Cordell Hall. They were, they knew nothing about it. it. This was generally the policy of the State Department, which was, we're going to focus, as a, as it, this was the Roosevelt policy, that we're going to focus on winning the war. And when we win the war, those who commit crimes against humanity will be punished and, uh, State Department officials were not sure of the accuracy of this. The World Jewish Congress was not a government um, uh, uh, arm. It, it had no governmental status and decisions were made by bureaucrats, middle managers that uh, circulating this telegram that you've seen, it would be of no purpose and, uh, and not uh, contribute to uh, what was in the interest of the United States and uh, or the plan of the United States and therefore it was kept a secret until 50 years later when it was no longer what you would call a threat to national security it just walked wor worked its way into the public view so now uh, when people come to me and they want to uh, see the original and they sometimes I'm asked by museums and so forth if uh, I'll lend the the, the telegram so people can see it on display. I always tell them to go to the National Archives and get the original. So, uh, uh, but you can come to Cincinnati and see this uh, uh, document. I wanna go from that uh, very somber document to something a little more lighthearted. And that is a story that begins in this synagogue, which, no longer stands. It's 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 the synagogue of what's called B'nai Israel Congregation in Cincinnati, Ohio. Today it's known as Rockdale Temple, and it this is one of its not its first its second building. It was located on Mound Street in Cincinnati, and uh, it was quite a quite a, a facility as you can see. And uh, it had to be torn down for the building of I-75. And so uh, it is gone. But 
we have photos and you're looking at the photo of it. That's part of documenting history. And we're gonna go into the basement of the Mound Street Temple where uh, there was a little uh, prayer and a uh, uh, um, little um, uh, underground or you know classroom, if you will. This is at the bottom of the, uh, the building. And it was in this space that the Hebrew Union College began to meet in 1875 in October. So the first students to study at the Hebrew Union College studied in this space. And then they would sometimes go over to the president's synagogue, which still does stand where Rabbi Borowski received her ordination. And that's at the Plum Street Temple which is one of the most magnificent synagogues in the world. And I'm gonna show you the interior of that synagogue right now. It is, uh, it is a masterpiece and in pristine condition. And we also had classes there. But in 1881, only about six, seven years after the school began, a mansion was purchased in downtown Cincinnati. And that mansion was on two streets, cross, at cross streets of Sycamore and Six. These, uh, this building no longer stands, but to prove to you that it was converted into the Hebrew Union College, I'm going to blow up the door. And there you see with a little more clarity over the door stop, over the top of the uh, doorway, it says Hebrew Union College. And this is where the college existed and all classes met until the year 1911 when the college moved to the current location. Now in the year 1883, this was a major event in American Jewish history because the first four American trained rabbis were ordained. They began their studies in 1875. They were high school students. After four years, they received a high school diploma. Then they were admitted to the University of Cincinnati and they spent four more years earning a baccalaureate degree. All eight years, they studied Judaism and uh, scripture and, and uh, rabbinic literature. And uh, here, was the great moment, the ordination of the first four rabbis. There's their names, David, uh, uh, Aaron, Henry Berkowitz, Joseph Krauskopf, and David Philipson. Now, that event took place in July of 1883. And of course, being good Jews, after the ordination, you have to have a celebration. So uh, there was a big party planned for the delegates of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, the patron of the Hebrew Union College. 250 people came from all over America to have to witness the ordination of these first four young rabbis and to have a big party celebrating the accomplishment of the Hebrew Union College and that party took place right here at the Highland House, also no longer in existence. The Highland House sat on what's called today Mount Adams. Uh, it's hard to see, but there was, what's the name of a train that, that uh, you have that takes you up and down a hill? It begins with an F. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, funicula, is that it? Nick, a funicula. Yeah. You can see on the very corner very, very corner, there's this train station and you can see a little bit of the train in the picture. Uh, there was a funicula that carried you from the Ohio River right up to the Highland House. You could stay at the Highland House. They had a beautiful veranda, which you can see clearly. And it was the place, it was the Ritz uh, in Cincinnati at its time. And you could stay there and then you could take the funicula and go down to the Ohio River and sh swim and uh, you had to be careful not to get hit by a barge, but uh, you could then get on your funicular and come back up to the Highland House. And 
This is where the banquet on July the 11th was held. Now imagine yourself, friends, your distinguished members of the union. You've come to Cincinnati, Ohio. You're staying at the Highland House. And that night, you've, that day, you've attended the ordination. You're full of pride. You're going to the banquet. You walk into this magnificent banquet, beautiful set tables, and on every single plate, there's a menu. And here it is. Now, I have, uh, of course, blown the menu up so you can see it clearly. But the actual size of the menu, it's very minuscule. It's uh, probably about, the whole menu is about this size that I'm showing you. It's very petite and it was put on your plate as was the custom in those days. But there you have the cover and the back. This is the cover in the back. You see it there with your own eyes, the banquet in honor of the delegates to the Council of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, July 11th. 1883, the Highland House. And you can see that we had an orchestra at this uh, event. What a, what, a, what a fair. So now you're sitting at your table and you want to open the menu to see what am I going to be eating? So let's do that. Well, you discover that you're going to begin with little neck clams. That will be your opening. And then a little later, you're going to have salad de shrimp. And then and soft shell crabs. you're going to have, right, soft shell crabs, of course. Uh, you'll, I didn't circle it, but uh, 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 up at the top, if you take a look uh, under uh, uh, relevé, of course, you notice it's all in French, very fancy. But uh, does anybody what, know what? Grenou, Grenou, uh, Grenouille is uh, in French. Grenouille à, à, à la crème. That's frog's legs. <laughs> yes. So you're going to have a, a, a puree of frog's legs uh, poured on your cauliflower. Uh, and uh, for those of you who uh, are not aware, uh, uh, frog's legs are about as kosher as uh, little neck clams. So, uh, and of course, uh, Ice cream, I mean, if you're going to have chicken for the main course, why the hell can't you have ice cream if you've had clams and shrimp and so forth? So this is known, you are looking at, friends, the only surviving copy of what's now referred to in history as the Trefa Banquet menu. And this is one of the most misunderstood documents in all of American Jewish history because the story that's told about this document is the following. And what I'm about to tell you is all false, but this is what is said again and again and again. People say, when people opened up this menu, dozens of these people attending this banquet were indignant and they stood up and stormed out. They checked out as quickly as they could. They all took a train back to New York City where they immediately established the Jewish Theological Seminary of New York and conservative Judaism was born. Now, this is a wonderful story. The only problem is there's not a bit of truth to it. Uh, this took place, as you see, in 1883 and the founding and opening of the Jewish Theological Seminary does not occur until 1887. Now that's a very long, slow burn. And what is uh, really and truly the beginning of the conservative movement has to do with the Pittsburgh platform, which was 1885, not this manual. The other uh, uh, untruth, which uh, is uh, all of this that I'm telling you, I've learned from reading an excellent article, which is available online by Rabbi Dr. Lance Sussman, one of our colleagues, who's the rabbi of Rodef Shalom in, in uh, uh, excuse me, he's the rabbi of Knesset Israel of uh, Philadelphia and a very fine scholar, PhD. And that article has been published in the Journal of the American Jewish Archives. 
and that article is available for you to see. What he points out is that only a very few people were indignant about this, and most of those who were ticked off were rabbis. But the majority of the people who were attending this banquet were not rabbis. The majority of these people were, were lay people. And Dr. Sussman points out that this is what they would have expected to eat because this is how the Central European immigrants who had been here since the 1840s ate. They didn't uh, uh, usually eat pork at Jewish events, but that uh, all of the shratzim, the uh, uh, clams and shrimp and uh, lobster and stuff of that sort, uh, oysters, these were all viewed as fruit de la mer, uh, sea fruit, and uh, you could you could you could enjoy it. Now you may say, Zola, that's hard to believe. I can't believe that this would happen where Jews would be eating this. This this must have been something that Isaac Mayer Wise did himself. No truth to any of it, and I'm gonna prove it to you. Here is, you're looking at uh, a menu uh, from uh, the uh, B'nai B'rith Lodge. If you look carefully, you can see it says 1886. So it's almost contemporaneous with the uh, Trefa Banquet menu. And I'm going to try if I, I think I did, I think I blew up right here. You see, it tells you what they're having, you're having as an appetizer. Let me see. Oh, no, no, I, I didn't blow it up. But if, if, if you look carefully, you can see it right where I'm putting my, oh, I'm sorry, right where I'm putting my mouse, you can see it says oysters. Okay. So there you have proof that a B'nai B'rith Lodge had it, but we can go on. Here's a wedding anniversary menu for a golden anniversary for this lovely couple. They were married in 1845, so it's 1895. This is about uh, 12 years after the Trefa Banquet menu. And they're having a souvenir of the golden wedding for Abraham and Fanny. What did Abraham and Fanny have at their 50th? Well, we know. Oysters on the shell. There it is. And even at the Hebrew Union College, the alumni had a 15th annual reunion in 1898, and they were celebrating one of the professor's 70th birthday. And we know what they ate too. Right up at the top oysters. So I could show you another 20 of these menus. What I'm trying to say to you is, right, all of these things, it was the way every uh, uh, wealthy, the wealthy Jews ate in those days, and the Trefa banquet would not have been a surprise to any of them. The only people who were indignant were some of the more traditional rabbis who raised their voices and complained, and Isaac Mayer Wise was stupefied by their uh, uh, being so surprised and indignant. So it's a fascinating event, but uh, uh, the truth of the matter is this is how people ate. And it wasn't until the Eastern Europeans began to pour in and return to a loyalty to a more what we would call kosher cuisine that you have this story being overlaid with all sorts of ridiculous, uh, you know, Isaac Mayer Wise uh, wanted to prove some point and that's why he did this. He wanted to demonstrate how reform he was. Well, anybody who knows Isaac Mayer Wise knows that that couldn't possibly be true. It, he was all about keeping as many Jews together as he could. He would never do anything that would threaten his own school, which he loved and worked for. And a, a lot of people say, Oh, the caterer was a Gentile. So when they told him to make fish, he didn't know that he shouldn't make uh, shrimp and so forth as fish. That's a bunch of malarkey. We know all about the caterer. The caterer was a Jew. So he knew full well what he was doing. So these are all, the, it's, it's hard to take, but the documents prove that 
this is how the Jews really ate. They had Americanized, they acculturated, and their, their idea was pork is maybe a little more than we should tolerate, but everything else uh, is, uh, can, be, can be dealt with in a Jewish venue. Now, I, I want to uh, show you uh, another wonderful document that we have here. I'm keeping my eye on the time. Uh, actually, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I, you know what I think I'm going to do is I think I'm going to, um, since I don't want to, I could keep you here all day. I'm going to, um, I'm going to go to uh, something else. I'm going to go to this document here. You all can see Stephen Wise now, picture of Stephen Wise. Okay, so we have at the American Jewish Archives, we have 170 uh, 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 what you would call sermons or addresses that Stephen Wise delivered from the year 1930 to 1942 at Carnegie Hall in uh, New York. Uh, his synagogue did not have its own building. It had an office building, but uh, Rabbi Wise spoke uh, every week, uh, led services on Sundays at Carnegie Hall. And he spoke rarely on Torah, his addresses were all about things going on in the world. And these recordings were made on aluminum albums, which is like a record album that we're familiar with, except made of aluminum. And very few of these have survived, but the American Jewish Archives has, as I said, 177 of these sermons, and they are extremely rare. They are heard nowhere else. And over the years that I've been the director, I've raised the money to digitize and clean every one of them. And so they're all available. And now I'm going to play for you a sermon that Stephen Wise, uh, not the whole sermon, just a little excerpt. So you can actually be projected back to Carnegie Hall. The year is 1940, uh, 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 1940. Uh, it is, uh, uh, no, 1941, excuse me, it's the year is 1941, November of 1941. And he is projecting that uh, America is going to go to war against the Germans. He does not know, of course, that the not, uh, Jap Japanese will attack, the uh, uh, two weeks later, will attack Pearl Harbor. And in this sermon that he delivers, uh, uh, he speaks, uh, he gives three point sermon. And he says that the Jew, what will happen to the Jew in the war? He says the Jew in the war will be a sufferer. The Jew in the war will be a soldier. And the Jew in the war will be a symbol. And I'm going to now play for you a little bit of the conclusion. He tells a story. This is the conclusion he draws when he's speaking about the Jew as a symbol, what the Jew and the Jewish people will symbolize as a result of the war. This is, uh, uh, you're going to listen to his actual voice as it was delivered in November of 1941. Story of Rabbi Werner in one of the neighboring countries of Germany who was captured by the Gestapo, <coughs> tortured and mocked, and finally, for it was the Sabbath, these Gestapo agents turned to Rabbi Werner and they force him, after stripping him of his garments, tear the wedding ring from his hand, teeth which are not even, 
capable of sustaining the effort. And then after these false teeth of this aged rabbi have been ground under the heels of a storm trooper, they turn to him and say, today is the Sabbath. You are going to preach today. You will preach your sermon to us. Rabbi Verna preaches the sermon to them as they interrupt him with blows and kicks. And the subject of his address that day, the sermon he would have preached to his congregation, was upon the theme, All men are human, sinners, wrongdoers, the apparently wicked and ruthless and cruel, still they are human. Finally, as the essence of what the rabbi is saying breaks into their consciousness, the stormtroopers overwhelmed with viciousness and guilt turn to him and say, and are we too human? You consider us human also, and they rain blows and kicks and cruelties upon him. And so they say, are we human? And in one of the great moments of Jewish history, Rabbi Werner turns to them in the midst of all their cruelties and horrors heaped upon him and answers in the essence of the Jewish spirit, Doch, Doch, even you, even you are human, despite all that they may do, despite all that they might do. In other words, the Jewish understanding that there is humanity which cannot be destroyed in any man will not be broken. Here in the Jew rises victorious above a thousand Gestapos and ten thousand Nazis. Triumphs as it triumphs through ages of persecution. Friends, you've just heard a voice that's 80 years old. And uh, I, uh, I, I think it's a remarkable message uh, when you think about it, uh, that uh, his, his uh, answer to what will the Jew symbolize after all of the horrors of Nazi Germany, and, and even though he doesn't know yet about the extermination, and he argues, that we will never ever give up on our commitment to human decency and that will be our message to the world um, it's a powerful i could give you this written out but it does not it doesn't convey the emotion and what it what what it would be like to actually hear him deliver that uh, when, and, and we have so many topics like that over 12 years that we have this collection. Uh, I'm, I, uh, uh, Rabbi, tell me, uh, it's right now, it's 1.28 um, by my time. It's 12.28 by your time. So j be honest, when, when should we end? Because, you know, I don't want to, you know, uh, I remember Dr. Marcus uh, used to teach me and everybody else who studied with him, the mind can endure only as much as the tushy can tolerate. So I, I, uh, I don't want to overstay my welcome, but uh, it give me an idea of one or two other things I can show you. Give me a, give me when we normally conclude. Normally? Yeah, <laughs> this is a bonus session. Normally, we conclude wow. after our study at 11, 11, 15. So we are in bonus time and enjoying it. <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to then I'm going to just show you two more things and then that'll be it. So uh, uh, what I was going I'm not going to show you, but just as long as we're on this slide is <clears throat> that we have. 
a, a lot of material on Dr. King and Dr. King's relationship with the Jewish community, because Dr. King had, uh, from his earliest efforts, uh, reached out to the Jewish community and spoke in synagogues. And so we have uh, in our collection, not only uh, 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 copies of the speeches that he delivered in synagogues and to Jewish organizations, we also have some recordings. And I was going to play for you uh, uh, a recording of Dr. Uh, King, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk to you uh, just for a second uh, about women in the rabbinate and in the cantorate. The American Jewish Archives is keeping a record of the first 100 women who entered the rabbinate and the cantorate because hundreds of years from now, uh, their stories will need to be told and, and, and we need to preserve that. So I just wanna show you uh, some of the uh, uh, material that we have. Uh, this is, of course, Rabbi Sally Prezan, who was ordained by Dr. Gottschalk. Uh, we're coming on the 50th anniversary of her ordination, which will be in 2022. And here uh, is a letter Rabbi Prezend has given us her papers. And uh, you see in 1963, she's uh, admitted to the Hebrew Union College as an undergraduate, not yet to the rabbinic program. And then I love this picture of Sally because what you can see right up here where my mouse is, is behind her is the sign, the American Jewish Archives. This is Sally as a student on the campus standing in front of the American Jewish Archives, okay? And there's, I've circled that. And uh, then we have her letter that she is uh, admitted as a special student. They still don't know what to do with her in 64. And then finally, uh, she's explained that the world, she, she complains uh, she doesn't want. She wants to know what does a special student mean? Does that mean she's not a rabbinical student? And uh, the, pro, uh, the 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 explanation is that it has no adverse connotation. That we have are required all unmarried uh, undergraduate students to live on the campus, and we don't have housing for women. So we're giving you special permission to live off campus as a single woman. Um, okay, and. Uh, uh, finally, 1968, four years before her ordination, I am pleased to inform you officially that you have been admitted to rabbinical school. And in 1972, she is ordained. Now, uh, I want to uh, just show you um, uh, uh, something I think you'll enjoy. Um, just bear with me. The second woman to be ordained was not ordained at the Hebrew Union College, but was ordained by the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in Philadelphia. And this is a picture of her. She's now retired. Her name is Rabbi Sandy Sasso of Indianapolis. And I want uh, to see if there's a volunteer of someone who will read a letter they did a when she was a student uh, they did an interview for her it appeared in the new york times and a woman wrote a letter to uh rabbi to be sasso in the year 1970 she had just started her studies because she was going to be ordained in 74 two years after sally is there anyone who would read from the word still who'd volunteer to read so we have class participation uh right here where it says still can somebody do that you can read it make it make it out i can do it I okay go ahead david please still you look pretty enough in the picture and being jewish i am just prejudiced enough to figure that you are smart too. 
So I am hoping that you will do a very great deal of studying and somewhere along the line, you will find out that you are pursuing a wrong goal <laughs> and you just might back up and end up on the right track after all. I sincerely hope so. Oh my. Keep, keep going, keep going. Oh, keep going, <laughs> all right. Ordinarily, I would sign off by wishing you much success, but this time I will refrain. In fact, frankly, I hope you don't make it for your sake, mine, and everyone else's. Wow. Now, this is a, a very colorful demonstration of why we need to keep documents like this and why <laughs> it's good and important because I don't know if Rabbi Boralski will confirm or deny, but I don't suspect that when she studied, she ran into that kind of negative uh, response. But she will be, I trust, the first to admit that these are the people who paved the way for her. And, um, and we need to be able to preserve the difficulties they face. Uh, however, they uh, er, those early uh, 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 those early uh, pioneers didn't only face uh, these kinds of challenges. Sometimes they were objects of fascination, and even to the American public in general. And here's an illustration of that. Uh, for the, their counseling, is that true? Sometimes. Yeah. And you yeah. can do your this thing in their home. Sometimes, yes. please, yes. Uh, this, there's one aspect of their work which is involved with counseling, but only one aspect. But only one aspect. Uh, when you when you do your your service, uh, do do you ever have to um, use any equipment? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> when the people you uh, have availed themselves of the of the service, uh, do they feel better? We hope so. Uh, mentally? Perhaps. Perhaps. Physically? Doubtful. No. Three down and seven to go, Alan. Is what you do, does that have anything to do with religion of any kind? Yes. Is your title reverend? No. Are no. They, oh, Four down and six to go, Are you Arlene? rabbis? They are rabbis. Yeah. Yeah. Sandy and Dennis were both just ordained and became the first husband and wife rabbi in the 5,734 year history of Judaism. Imagine. The first ones. That's amazing. How did you both decide to do that? Separately. We met at the rabbinical college. And were married while you were there or after, after you got After our first year. Mm -hmm. It's a five year program. Now, do you, do you preach together? Do you have the, uh, you work no. in the same congregation? We have separate congregations in New York City. And Mine is in Great Neck. I'm just stunned. You know, well, I just what is what the congregation of a woman like you know? Uh... Well, my congregation is very unique and is very accepting of a woman, but there are definitely congregations that would not hire a woman rabbi. That's amazing because it's such a male-oriented religion. It really is in terms of yeah. uh, certainly in terms I would of. Say most Western religions are. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Do you enjoy it? Very much. <laughs> I just think it's terrific and fascinating, Hello, and, and we have to end the program. Goodbye, everybody. We'll tell you about it next time if we can. Goodbye. That's really marvelous. So uh, uh, that was uh, uh, t that was what's my line, and uh, those of you who saw Stoopy Sales was there to ask uh, Rabbi Sasso uh, what the congregation thinks of. Uh, uh, how she gets along with her congregation. Uh, we're going to conclude the last document I'm going to show you is also a media document, and it'll be a sort of an introduction to uh, tomorrow for those of you who are going to want to endure yet another uh, session. Uh, this is a picture of Rabbi Joachim Prinz. Uh, Rabbi Prinz uh, was... Um, a, a German rabbi 
born in Germany, born in Berlin, and uh, ordained and trained in Berlin. And in 1937, he is exiled, he's banished, and he leaves and comes to the United States where he becomes a rabbi in Newark, New Jersey. And he becomes a protege of Stephen Wise, about whom we spoke briefly. And after Wise's death, Joachim Prinz will become the president of the American Jewish Congress, an organization that uh, Rabbi Wise started. And in the uh, 1950s, Dr. Prinz leads the American Jewish Congress to be very involved in uh, social justice work and especially in civil rights and uh, causes related to the liberation of uh, American uh, Negro. And uh, in 1963, the American Jewish Congress uh, co-sponsors uh, the March on Washington with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And as a result, Rabbi Prinz speaks at the March on Washington right before Dr. King delivers his iconic address. And most people, of course, understandably, have not heard Rabbi Prinz's remarkable words, uh, his uh, stunning words, about three minutes in length, because of Dr. King's iconic address, I have a dream. Well, you're going to get to hear it. This will be our last document. Mark, do you want to hear this? And uh, uh, show you just a few pictures from that day. This is Dr. King and Dr. Prinz and others behind Dr. Prinz. You see Walter Ruther of the AFO, not LCIO, uh, and other religious leaders. They all took a picture um, at the Lincoln Memorial. I don't know whether this was after the march or before it, but you see Dr. King second from the right, and uh, you see uh, standing next to Dr. Prinz is John Lewis, the late congressman, and many other prominent uh, figures. They went to the White House that day, and there they are with President Kennedy and President Vice President Johnson, and they're standing next to Dr. King and in front of uh, someday to be Congressman Lewis is Joachim Prinz, the rabbi. And uh, let's hear Rabbi Prinz's prayer. speak to you as an American Jew. Our fathers taught us thousands of years ago that when God created man, he created him as everybody's neighbor. Neighbor is not a geographic term. It is a moral concept. It means our collective responsibility for the preservation of man's dignity and integrity. Our Jewish historic experience of three and a half thousand years began with slavery and the yearning for freedom. I was the rabbi of the Jewish community in Berlin under the Hitler regime. I learned many things. The most important thing that I learned in my life is that bigotry and hatred are not 
the most urgent problem, the most urgent, the most disgraceful, the most shameful, and the most tragic problem is silence. A great people which had created a great civilization had become a nation of silent onlookers. They remained silent in the face of hate, in the face of brutality, and in the face of mass murder. America must not become a nation of onlookers. America must not remain silent, not merely black America, but all of America. It must speak up and act from the president down to the humblest of us, and not for the sake of the Negro, not for the sake of the black community, but for the sake of the image, the dream, the idea, and the aspiration of America itself. Our children, yours and mine, in every school across the land, every morning pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the republic for which it stands, and then they, the children, speak fervently and innocently of this land as a land of liberty and justice for all. The time, I believe, has come to work together, for it is not enough to hope together, and it is not enough to pray together, to work together, that, that this children's oath pronounced every morning from Maine to California, from north to south, that this oath will become a glorious, unshakable reality in a morally renewed and united America. Thank you. Well, friends, uh, I think uh, I've uh, probably pushed the limits of our tushy to the extreme, but uh, I just will say one thing that I'm sure you'll, I, I trust you'll all agree. Uh, I was one of those children about whom he was speaking uh, at that stage. I was in the classroom around the age. Uh, 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 putting my hand on my heart and saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, much of all of what he said is uh, more resonant and more uh, uh, pressing than, uh, than it has been uh, uh, probably since he uttered them. And that is uh, that uh, we can't be silent about what's wrong in our society. We have to speak up and we Jews can't be onlookers. Uh, so uh, we, uh, you've now seen the purpose of my showing you these documents is uh, several fold. First, I want you to know about the American Jewish Archives and to be proud of what you in your own little way have helped to create by being a member of this congregation and the congregation being a part of our union, which uh, helps, helps to sustain the college. And second, I want you to uh, really take pride in its holdings and what it offers, because if we don't have these memories and we don't preserve them, uh, Dr. Marcus was absolutely right. 
if we have no consciousness of our past, we have little hope for our future. And what has happened in our country these past few years is indicative of a lack of understanding of our heritage, our American heritage. And so uh, we need to focus on the truth and on the past uh, so that we can move forward. Uh, and that's why preserving and promoting our history is so very important. I, uh, I would love to stay and show you more and more, but we'll do a little more tomorrow. But you've been such a nice, wonderful patient. I've watched the numbers. I don't think we lost uh, too many. So uh, it, it's been a pleasure. And I hope that one day uh, I'll have an opportunity to show you all the American Jewish Archives myself. Uh, you see uh, the treasure trove that really as it is. Uh, until then, I guess all I can say is I'll quote the famous Colonel William Prescott and paraphrase what he said at the Battle of Bunker Hill when he told his men, don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. Uh, I've been saying to people, I can't wait to see the whites of people's eyes. So thank you very much. And Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much, Dr. Zola. Um, I also, I want to add, by the way, that as you are noticing the various names and faces around the screen of people that you know, um, there's one where you probably don't know the face, but you know the face of her daughter. Um, so Caitlin Brasner is one of your, I believe, current students. And yes, her, yes. Her mom, uh, Lois, is on your screen. <laughs> oh, well, you know what? I'm Now I'm going to do something that I know is going to sound uh, 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 like a quid pro quo, but it is not. Caitlin is outstanding, is an outstanding student. And I want to tell you about something. Did she tell you about her final project? She's in my class right now on Reform Judy. Did she tell you about it? Okay, so I, I'm going to now uh, do something I shouldn't do, but I, I'm so cranked up about this that I have to share this with you. There are people who don't understand how important it is to have a great library like we have at the college and have a great American Jewish archives. Unfortunately, sometimes these people are on our, are on our board of governors, but sometimes these people are all over our country who say, listen, how many books can a rabbinic student use, right? How many do they need? Do they need 800 million books? You know, do, do they need the rarest books? They never look at them. They never use them. It's just an expense that, that we, we can't afford anymore, okay? So uh, Lois's daughter is in my class. She has to do a project and uh, she, it's on, on the history of Reform Judaism. So she comes to me and she says, you know, I am pretty good at French. I read French. And I, of course, when we study Reform Judaism, we study European reform and we study reform in America. And she said, do you think uh, there's anything that I could do with a French document? And so I said, well, uh, they're, they're actually at the very early phases of reform in France, back in the 1840s and 50s in Europe, there was a mathematician, his name was Olri Turquim. That was his name, Olri Turquim. And I said, he was a mathematician and he wrote articles in French about the reformation of Judaism. And he was a radical thinker. He was a, a very liberal in his ideas and a very little pe did people pay attention to him. I said, to the best of my knowledge, his work has never been translated. Let's see if we can find the papers. So with a little help with the librarians and so forth, well, sure enough, in the rare book room, they had collected in the rare book room all of his French articles. And uh, Caitlin is going to be translating some of them for her final project. And I, I, I use this as an example because it's true. Maybe Caitlin might have gotten through five years of rabbinical school and never used a rare book or the rare book room you know, like a great towering scholar is, but she'll never forget that experience. And the fact that we have it and that we make it available is what makes our ordinees different from people who can write in and get ordination for $20,000 online. 
And so we never should forget this. It's if you if we want quality, we have to sustain quality. So this is my I'm so glad to meet you. And I look forward to celebrating at ordination someday soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. This is really Zola. terrific. All right, I'll see y'all or whoever's going to join us tomorrow. It's been a pleasure. Thank Have you. a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you. We Thank hope you. to see Thank many of you tomorrow. So 1230. Hello. We have Havdala at 630 if you'd like to join me for that without Dr. Zola. I mean, he's welcome, but not required. <laughs> <laughs> so have a wonderful rest of your yeah, day. Shabbat, you shalom. Shabbat, shalom. Shabbat, shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, everybody. everybody. Shabbat shalom. That was awesome. One of the few times I wish he were face to face so I could talk with him about the people that I know at the union. Maybe he'll read a chat. Helga, we were around Dudley in all the days he was teaching. Yeah. Thanks, my and, wonderful memories. And Eve Joan. I don't remember you there, Stanley. Oh, he was there. Although I think they joined Helga. And Frank, Frank's mother, Linda Frank's mother, was a student there. Well, I wanted to make these visible, but I couldn't do it. I didn't have a place to put them. But um, Margot Zimmerman dropped these off at my house so that I could have of uh, flowers last night. So thank you, Margo, when you first see this. Baruch Hashem. Very nice. Why am I muted? Hmm. Now can you hear me? I don't think so. And there we are. Can you hear me?